Now, in fact, so that was in 2001, but in fact, the scientific evidence had actually coalesced rather earlier. In the second assessment report of the IPCC, published in 1995, so more than 15 years ago, the IPCC had concluded, quote, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human impact on global climate. So often we hear people arguing about, well, maybe there's global warming, but we don't actually know if there's a human cause. But in fact, the IPCC had addressed that in 1995. Now, in my own work, I was curious about whether or not the position taken by the IPCC was indicative of what rank and file scientists publishing in peer reviewed scientific journals have to say. So my students and I did an analysis of the peer reviewed journals. And indeed, we, we showed that yes, the IPCC conclusion was an accurate reflection of rank and file scientists. In fact, we were able to show that scientists had a consensus on the reality of human caused climate change by the early 1990s, and it was that consensus that was reflected in the second assessment report in 1995. Now, we published this in Science Magazine, and the results surprised many people, but really it shouldn't have. Many Americans seem to have forgotten, but in 1992, President George H.W. Bush signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change which committed the United States, along with 163 other signatories, to preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. And when President George H.W. Bush signed the UN Framework Convention, he called on world leaders to, quote, translate the written document into concrete action to save the planet. So that was in 1992. Now, as part of this project, I interviewed many people who had been involved in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. One of them was Gus Speth, who served on the Council of Environmental Quality in the Carter administration. And when I asked him about it, he said, yeah, we thought we were on track to make real changes. So what happened? What happened to the political and scientific consensus reflected by that UN framework consensus that was supported by both Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C., and 163 nations around the world. So what I want to do today is to answer that question by, first of all, giving you a brief history of the evolution of climate science to help you understand what some of the benchmarks in scientific research have been that led to that 1995 consensus, and then talk about my recent work on this, which is the history of the emergence of a political challenge to the scientific evidence. It's a story of selling uncertainty, of exploiting the idea of uncertainty to stave off government regulation and protect the free market as some people understood it. So let's talk a little bit about the history of climate science, what scientists know about the climate system and when they knew it. Most historians of science would say that the modern history of climate science begins with this man, John Tyndall, the Irish experimentalist who first established the concept of a greenhouse gas. Through a series of experiments, Tyndall showed that certain gases, most significantly water vapor and carbon dioxide, had a very important and distinctive property of being highly transparent to visible light, so sunlight penetrates easily through water and carbon dioxide, but relatively opaque to infrared or heat. So in short, these gases allow light to come in, but trap heat. And Tyndall recognized that this was an extremely important property of the Earth's atmosphere, because without these so-called greenhouse gases, the Earth would be as cold as Mars or the Moon, and it would not be able to sustain life on Earth. So the natural greenhouse effect is a good thing. But like many things in life, there can be too much of a good thing. And the first person to suggest that idea was this man, Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish geochemist. Arrhenius was the first person to suggest that by burning fossil fuels, mainly coal, we could increase, we might increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that could change the heat balance of the atmosphere and cause the Earth to warm up. Arrhenius did the first calculations of what would happen to the Earth's climate if we doubled atmospheric carbon dioxide and came up with these figures, one and a half to four and a half degrees centigrade. So that is to say as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit for doubling atmospheric CO2. Now, Arrhenius was Swedish, so he thought global warming would be a good thing. <laughs> the first person to suggest that it might be a bad thing was this man, Guy Stewart Callender, who in the 1930s published the first article in the Quarterly Journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, the first article to suggest that carbon dioxide was already increasing that measurements showed a small but detectable increase, and that the temperature might be increasing too. 
Now, that was in 1938. As some of you know, if you've studied any history at all, you know that 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Things got kind of rough in Europe. And so Callender became involved in war work. He dropped the question of atmospheric CO2, as did most of his colleagues. And scientists didn't really get back to the issue until the 1950s. In 1950, in the mid-1950s, a number of scientists began to look at this question again. These two men, Hans Zeus, geo a geochemist, and Roger Revell, an oceanographer and later the mentor to Al Gore. Zeus and Revell published an article in 1957 in which they noticed, or they said, claimed that mankind was performing a great geophysical experiment, that by burning fossil fuel, we were taking carbon dioxide that had been stored in rocks over the course of 200 million years of geological history and returning that carbon dioxide very rapidly to the atmosphere that in doing that, we might be changing the chemistry of the atmosphere in a way that could have serious and even grave consequences. Now, one of the things that Ravel recognized as an oceanographer is that the ocean has a tremendous capacity to absorb carbon dioxide. So if the CO2 released by burning fossil fuels was absorbed into the oceans, then there wouldn't be atmospheric warming. But if the carbon dioxide stayed in the atmosphere, then it would lead to global warming. And so a key question was to measure the carbon dioxide to answer the question, how much of this CO2 stays in the atmosphere and how much of it is absorbed by the oceans or taken up by plants? And the man he recruited to do this work was this man, Dave Keeling. So in 1958, so this is more than 50 years ago now, Dave Keeling began measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as part of the International Geophysical Year. That became his life's work, for which he subsequently won the National Medal of Science awarded to him by President George W. Bush. Well, in just a few years, what is now known as the Keeling Curve had started to emerge. So this is what the Keeling Curve looks like today. We now know that atmospheric CO2 is up at about 390 parts per million, so about 30 to 35% higher than it was before the Industrial Revolution. But already by 1965, Killing had done enough work to show that there was indeed a steady, slow, measurable, detectable increase in carbon dioxide. And it was this measurement that led Ke Ravel, Killing, and a few others to write a report on this issue warning about the potential consequences of unmitigated CO2 increase. And in 1975, as part of the President's Science Advisory Committee, Ravel and Killing wrote, quote, by the year 2000, there will be about 25% more CO2 in the atmosphere than at present, and this will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that market changes in climate could occur. So today we talked a little bit about the word prediction versus projection and what's a better word to use, but this was a prediction. This was a specific prediction that atmosphere would, CO2 would increase a certain amount and that we would see detectable market changes in climate. And of course, this prediction has, in fact, come true. By now, we've seen about 30% uh, more CO2 in the atmosphere than at that time. Uh, this report reached the White House, and in 1965, Lyndon Johnson issued a special message to Congress in which he said, quote, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. So if anyone ever says to you, oh, you know, Nobody could have predicted this. Nobody could have known. That's not true. People did know. They did predict it. And at least one president got the message um, nearly 50 years ago.